from the BBC World Service in association with ABC and Akashvani. This is Stumped. Hello and welcome to Stumped, your intercontinental hit of news, features and debate from the quirky world of cricket. I'm Alison Mitchell in the ABC studios in Melbourne, uh, but this weekend I'm off to the Victorian Alps for a little bit of cycling and hiking just as my time in Australia starts to draw to a close. I can't wait. Great to have you still down under, Ali. Brett Sprigg here at the ABC in Sydney, where, of course, the cricket season is winding down, but there is still much for us here to discuss. And I'm Sunil Gupta for Akashwani in New Delhi, where the latest meme that is going around is that the last time that India beat Australia in any final whatsoever was in a movie about 12 years ago <laughs> called Chuck De India. And we've got to change that somehow, sometime, somewhere. It will get changed. <laughs> I'll tell you what, Sunil, we are going to be talking in the programme uh, shortly about the Under-19 World Cup final between Australia and India's men and also about the significance of the Aussie women in South Africa playing a test match at the moment as they are in Perth. Uh, but we're going to begin by talking about just what an incredible couple of years it has been for Australia all-rounder Mitchell Marsh. After winning the T20 World Cup in 2021, he was recalled to the test side for the Ashes test at Headingley last summer where he blazed that amazing 100 against England. He was then appointed captain of Australia Australia's T20 team and played a key role in winning the 50 over World Cup in India. Now he was recently awarded the Alan Border medal for being Australia's most outstanding male cricketer of the season and his acceptance speech you might remember went viral for reasons that we'll hear more about in a moment in a chat which I've had with Mitch where he also reveals something quite pertinent that was going on in the background every day during the Ashes and either side of that incredible Headingley 100 as well. But I began by asking him just what have the key ingredients been that have led to him having so much success in the last 12 months? I mean, yeah, it's been an incredible 12 months. Um, I mean, really a couple of years, I think. Uh, for me personally, just um, there's been an element of growth uh, in my game and who I am as a person. Yeah, I just really stuck at it. Um, and... Well, I said the other night in uh, my speech that I just wanted one more crack at Test cricket, and uh, I guess I'm just really proud that I sort of never gave up on that. Four years is a long time out of the game. Now I've had incredible support from our leadership team um, at Cricket Australia. So, and also I think just the team that we have at the moment, it's been incredibly fun to be around. And there's no doubt that there's high pressure situations that we face um, day in day out. But um, there's an element of just wanting to be around it, and wanting to be a part of it, and I guess that's really helped me. I have to say that after your um, speech at the AB medal, that there, there was a, an awful lot of emotion in that speech where you thanked Pat Cummins and Andrew McDonald for their faith in you. Where did that emotional honesty come from? Is that something that perhaps wouldn't have come out from you, you know, two, three, four, five years ago? Oh, yeah, well, absolutely. Um, I tried to take on everything, all my challenges by myself. Um, and that led me to some reasonably dark places when it came to my cricket and it wasn't until yeah probably a couple of years ago that uh, I sort of got to the point where I was a bit lost with my cricket I decided that I had to do something about it and um, the main thing was really just communicating how I was going and what I wanted to try and achieve and then finding people in my life that I could share that with and my wife's obviously been vitally important for that but I think there's a hopefully a good lesson for a lot of people out there that uh, no matter what you're going through you need to talk and for men especially I've had a couple of guys come up to me and uh, and thank me for showing a bit of emotion and um, and also saying that it's okay to be a bit fat <laughs> but um, liking I'm a beer occasionally um, yeah I'm certainly an advocate for uh, for the odd cry and and uh, showing emotion especially with other men well, this leads me to my next question and the cap that you're wearing as well, because I'd noticed on your yes. Insta bio that there was a link to find your feet. I clicked on it and then I was quite blown away by what I found because it was a link to a men's mental health charity, a very, very small uh, organisation yep. with a focus on young men in particular, but across all age ranges. Um, tell us about Find Your Feet, what it does, first of all. I'll take you back to when I met uh, Tommy Herschel, who runs the show. Um, I was in uh, on an island called Sumba in Indonesia, and uh, Tommy and his amazing family were staying at the same resort as myself and Greta, my wife. And uh, Tommy paddled out next to me in the lineup, 
uh, he's an amazing surfer. I'm a very poor surfer, <laughs> um, but I, but my enthusiasm's as high as his when it comes to the surf. So um, we got along very well. Basically, yeah, we were sharing a few waves and got into what he had no idea about cricket, which was great. Uh, he had no idea what I did. And, uh, you know, I sort of said, what do you do? And he goes, mate, I run an organisation called Find Your Feet. Um, and we're basically um, all about getting young men and, and girls um, talking about their emotions and um, yeah, understanding that you need to have avenues to talk about how you're going and deal with stuff. And I think most importantly, getting people, young men and boys and girls to understand that everyone's going through something in their life uh, and it's really important to um, to talk about it and have people in your life that you can go to. So as soon as Tommy sort of said that, um, and I guess the journey that I've been on with my cricket, um, getting to a point where I'm uh, pretty much an open book now with the people that I've got in my team, it really resonated with me and I'd never really jumped on board with anything like that. Um, I know there's a lot of great, uh, I guess, mental health charities and organisations out there, but Tommy just has this amazing vibe about him. And, and a real passion for um, what he's doing. So I basically said to him, mate, I'd love to be on, jump on board at some stage and, and help in any way possible. Because he's a, a former teacher, isn't he? Or a, a chalky, as he puts it in his um, in his a chalky, yeah. Speak. So he's got he's that got expertise. All, he's got all the quotes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So he runs what community workshops uh, as well as going into the corporate space as well. How have you sort of specifically got involved in helping out? The last probably six to 12, well, probably eight months, um, a young kid who uh, was going through a little bit of stuff, loves his cricket. He just sort of reached out through Tommy um, and, yeah, we got chatting. And um, So Tommy put him in touch was, with you for a bit of a yeah, pep talk. Yeah, just for a bit of a chat, yeah, <laughs> yeah. a bit of a pep talk. Um, I was at the Ash, in, over uh, in England for the World Test Championship in the Ashes. I basically said to this young kid, right, we're going to do a cold shower every morning. He'd wake up in the morning have a cold shower, he'd send a video message through or a text through saying, just checking in, um, have my cold shower. I'd wake up at the first thing in the morning, have a cold shower. And uh, we just built this connection through waking up every, in the morning and winning the morning. Um, wow. And, uh, yeah, formed a great friendship now. He loves his cricket. Um, and This was uh, just a young I, kid I, I, going through some difficulties, sort of school-wise, yeah. home-wise, whatever it might be. Yeah, so we've, yeah, we, we basically text each other each other every day for a couple of months um we keep in contact now and he's a ripping young kid but i feel like i think just giving someone like that and young kids an opportunity to see that oh, i go through stuff um and everyone throughout their life will go through stuff but it's about how we deal with it and um i guess for me i, I hate cold showers <laughs> um i love an ice bath but i hate cold showers <laughs> for some odd reason for me it's about achieving something um and starting a day off with a win and that sets my day up. And I think that that was something that hopefully he learned that um, you can wake up not feeling great, but it's bit, you, you've always got a choice as to, to how you deal with that. So, and that was something that we'd spoken about and Tommy's been fantastic for that um, for me as well. He's got quite a few ambassadors now that are, I guess, on the ground and, mm. and helping kids. It's not, it's, it's the big classrooms that get the, the workshops and stuff, but we're also helping young kids just day to day and, um, I think that's given me great fulfilment, I guess, in my position now, having the ability to hopefully help young kids understand that no matter what you're doing in life or how good your life may seem, we're always going through something and um, mm. it's having the, the tools and the ability to be able to talk open, openly to people and, um, and learn about yourself, which has been great for me. That's incredible that you're giving him that one-on-one -on -one messaging and building that rapport was that going on literally through the ashes were you messaging him daily during that headingly test match for example yeah yeah every day every day got up and had the cold shower and we'd message each other and um yeah it was special i think you're in the middle of a test match but i'm waking up and looking after my little buddy um with a cold shower uh yeah. as much as i hated them but yeah i guess it's little things like that that um to help people and it was uh it was probably a, a better experience for me than it was for the young fella <laughs> mitch it's been great to chat with you and to also understand the relationship that you're building up with these youngsters as well congratulations on that work as well as the amazing success you've had this year as well thank you Ali. really appreciate it well that was warmth and openness in abundance from mitch marsh wasn't it and suddenly i was watching you listening to that interview and you know 
the smiles on your face, I hope that everyone watching and listening as well was also sort of feeling that warmth. And, and Brett, I know that you know Mitch Marsh quite well. You, you're both Perth boys. Did you know that about him, that he did this work? And in particular, I found that incredible that, you know, in the heat of an Ashes test, in the heat of that moment in Headingley, that either side of that, he's every single day making sure that he's texting this young lad back in Australia to check in and make sure he's all right. No, I wasn't fully aware of that, Ali. It was a great chat. I used to think there wasn't a lot to a guy like Mitch Marsh. Um, He's been destined to play for Australia his whole life and much of his career he's been the subject of debate about exactly that and whether he truly deserved his opportunity. It's easy to say now, but being a fellow West Australian, I say that when it suits me, I've always thought much of that really unfair and seeing him speak about that during the Ashes of 2019, having that awareness was really heartbreaking, saying that he must be the most hated cricketer in Australia. But it never deterred him because of how highly his teammates rate him. Um, and he's had some great moments on field, but um, he's, he's had to mature as a human being and a cricketer at the same time, hasn't he? And, you know, he got married last year. He talks about the influence his wife has had on him. And then back to the cricket, he's a leader now. He'll probably be Australia's captain at the next T20 World Cup, as you say. So he's always been loved and respected by his peers. I think it's great the rest of the country and the world is catching up. And who knows, at 32, maybe the best is yet to come. But just exploring those facets away from cricket is really fascinating as well. Yeah, Sonil, it's um, easy to see why he's become so popular now and there's something in being that relatable, isn't there? You know, I was listening to this um, and I was just wondering, you know, not what you said about, you know, what he did during the Ashes series, you know, the intensity and so on and so forth, just being a human being. Sometimes, you know, especially in our part of the world, we, we, we uh, you know, sort of make them into heroes. We make them into demigods. And, and, you know, we, it, it's astonishing that the everydayness of a person comes through like this. Yes, he's a cricketer, but he's also a human being. You know, and he can walk into a pub and have a pint and nobody's going to you know, smother him. He's not going to have 16 security men around him. And that makes a big difference, actually, in the way that you perceive life, the way that you talk to people. Because as you know, Ali, and I'm sure you know, Brett, in this part of the world, it's completely different. You cannot walk into the street, you cannot walk into a coffee bar, you cannot walk anywhere without having security, people mobbing you, that type of thing. It goes to your head. But it's 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 so lovely to hear. And you can see it actually, a little bit of his personality on the field. Obviously, I mean, I don't know him, but I've seen him play and it just comes across. He's a straight, honest, direct guy. And that's the way he plays his cricket. And that's the way he lives his life. And I think it's tremendous. It was absolutely fascinating listening to him. And that's his message, isn't it, to the youngsters to to be open and to to be yeah. honest. And the fact that he is living that himself, and I think that message is so powerful, isn't it, that it doesn't matter sort of who you are. Everyone has stuff to go through, but the focus on you know those young men in particular uh, is is such a powerful message that yeah, Mitch and Tommy as uh, the name that he kept mentioning there, who who leads Find Your Feet. It's um yeah, it was really heartwarming. I felt to to learn that about yes. Mitch. So. Yes. Yeah. We wish him every success going forwards and indeed Tommy and the, the Find Your Feet organisation. Now, before Sunday, the last player to captain Australia to the under-19 Men's World Cup title was... Brett Sprigg? <laughs> Mitch Marsh. Mitch Marsh. <laughs> See, it's almost like we've planned this programme. That was back in 2010. Well, this week, Australia became under-19 world champions for the fourth time because they beat India by 79 runs in the final in South Africa. And when you look at the game as a whole, well, it's Australia's third straight win over India in an ICC tournament final, with the Aussie men already having beaten India in the World Test Championship final and last year's ODI World Cup final, of course, in India. Um, Brett, then how significant a win is this one in terms of, I, I guess, Australia is strength and depth. Yeah, it's always nice to know that things are tracking well and any of those underage World Cup wins is a nice validation of your pathways and, as you say, it's not lost on anyone that Australia can't seem to lose a World Cup at the moment. Um, So nothing of the fact that, much like the recent Men's World Cup, India was also unbeaten. Sorry, Sunil. And so was Pakistan, I think, up until the semi-final where Australia scraped home there. So to overcome those two mighty opponents was great. Uh, Ultimately, the legacy of an under-19 World Cup win all 
comes from what these players do next. Hugh Webgen, the captain, spoke about the inspiration they drew on from the senior men's team. Uh, but it's a <laughs> good achievement. Who as well. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and I, and I don't know. Maybe there was a sense that with so much cricket going on, we had our men's and women's teams in action at the same time. Maybe it got lost a little bit, but it's always nice to, to win a World Cup for sure. Uh, Sunil, I mean, India were the defending champions at under-19 level, but they just could not get going with the bats in the final, could they? All out for 174. Uh, what, what did you make overall of, of the way they, they played when it, when it really mattered? This is a question we keep asking ourselves as to what goes wrong. And if you remember, Ali, we asked, uh, or I asked Justin Langer when we did that program at Lords, I said, you know, this whole thing about choking and freezing. And he said a word which I thought was very important. He said... Desire. Now, I'm not saying the desire is not there, but desire leads to something. Desire leads to the fact that I am not going to give in. Desire leads to the fact that I'm going to be able to play my game in the way that I want and put the pressure back. That's exactly what Australia did, even in the World Test Championship final. They were 70 or 80 odd for three and went on to score that mammoth score. So I think that the issue is here that somewhere the belief, the self belief, and that desire deserts in the deserts the Indian team in the big moments. Finally, on stumps, it's been a long time coming, but Test cricket is back at the iconic Wacker Ground in Perth, where Australia's women are playing South Africa in a Red Bull match for the very first time. The historic test is part of a multi-format series between the two nations. South Africa have already picked up first ever wins against the Aussies in each of the ODI and T20 legs of the series. A test match is a somewhat different prospect, though. South Africa have only ever played 14 matches in their history, and this is only the third that have been played by South Africa's women since 2007. So they just do not play it as much as, well, it's not played a lot by any nation, is it? But South Africa in particular, this group, have not played much at all. Um, So Australia have gone into the test match leading eight points to four, meaning South Africa can draw the series if they win and take the four points on offer. Uh, The opening day didn't go too well for South Africa. Bowled out for 77, 76, 77 for the top of my head. But then they were fighting back with the ball. Uh, Brett, what's your take, and Sunil, on the significance of this test match for the wider women's game? I've been fortunate enough to cover um, most of the white ball games of this multi-format series and really found it an enthralling series, first of all, that South Africa got that first ever win, any format in the second T20 in Canberra, and just to tick off that bit of history and spark that belief, which then carried them into the 50-over component and they pulled off a shock there as well. So no one was really expecting the series to be as close as it's been. And it's a great advertisement for the multi-format series, beyond just how it's used in the Ashes. The Test match itself, well, as you say, it's the first time ever and just the fifth different opponent that Australia has played against in Test cricket. So, Test cricket at the Wacker is always special, and I think both sets of bowlers will get some use out of that wicket. So, Neil, the, the multi format series um, as a concept really has given women's test cricket a lifeline, hasn't it? Because even looking at, at India, you know, they had a huge gap between 2014 up until 2021 when they came and played a test match against England. They've played a couple then in 21 and 2023 still only between, you know, against England and Australia. But it really is that multi-format series which has given the format a lifeline. Yeah, exactly. I mean, when Australia came to India, <clears throat> it was a multi-format uh, series. Uh, India won the Test match, which was fantastic. I mean, I really do believe, you know, that the entire change that took place between the red ball and the white ball showed what India is capable of. Of course, the white ball series were lost. But I think it is a great... Uh, Thing for Indian cricket, for women's cricket everywhere, because when you get a team across, you might as well make the most of it. As you said, there's so little women's cricket at the international level taking place in terms of bilateral formats, not multilateral, but bilateral formats. And I think it really makes a big difference. And, you know, for a team like South Africa, they've got such good players. You know, we, we know their names, Marizan Kapp, and you said Laura Fulfart, and all these people. They should get an opportunity to test their skills in the longer format. Well, that is all we've got time for on this week's Stump. So a big thank you to our special guest, Mitch Marsh, and to Sunil Gupta and to Brett Sprigg, and, of course, to all of you for listening, and we'll see you again next week. Bye for now.